upsets, triumphs, and late game heroics through three weeks of the American football season. We've had it all. And now, welcome to week four, one of the most highly anticipated weeks of the entire college football season on a national sc scale and certainly here at the American. And welcome inside the studios for a brand new episode of All American. I'm your host, Morgan Uber. We will look forward to these week four matchups, breaking down a whole lot of them for you. Plus, Blake Watson, Memphis running back, will join the show. We'll get to all of that. But first, we dive in to the latest headlines with Memphis getting their first conference win of the season, starting 3-0, beating Navy at home in a Thursday night thriller. North Texas gets its first win in the new era of first-year head coach Eric Morris. And finally, Tulane bouncing back in the battle for the bell, defeating Southern Miss 21-3, extending their road game win streak to six. And the Green Wave once again without their starting quarterback, Michael Pratt, out with a left knee injury. And our quarterback, the former Rice Al and ESPN analyst Taylor McCarg joins the show. Taylor, thanks for joining us with Pratt. Frank Harris for UTSA. We saw him in a boot uh, during week three against Army. And then more recently, Casey Thompson, the news coming out of Florida Atlantic, he is done for the season. Taylor, what's your reaction to all of these quarterback injuries here this early in the season? Yeah, it's the worst part of the sport, injuries, right? And it's all about how your team responds. And I think I go back to Tulane and how they rallied around Kai Horton and how impressive that defense has been. That was a big win for them to go on the road and avenge that loss from last season. Do you see UTSA? I think they've struggled through the first part of the season with Frank Harris banged up. Now FAU, obviously a test coming up this weekend. As they get on the road against Illinois. What does that look like uh, with Casey Thompson now down? But it really is. It's all about rallying around your guys. And when you have a starting quarterback go down, especially, you still have to find a way to salvage the season and try to move forward with whoever's in that backup spot. And I think Tulane has done the best job of that so far. Next man up mentality. That's certainly what these teams are going to need. And Taylor, this week we've got 11 American football games. It's going to be great. So many marquee matchups in each of the TV windows. And the day all starts with SMU TCU at 11 a.m. Central, better known as the Battle for the Iron Skillet. This is a rivalry that goes all the way back to 1915. TCU has the all time record. 1946 is really when the game earned its name, Battle for the Iron Skillet. The story behind it, some SMU fans were frying up some frog legs at a tailgate, and the skillet was the wager. I'll say uh, frog legs are a hard no for me, but the last time that this game was in Fort Worth, the Mustangs picked up the win. Sonny Dykes was the head coach for SMU at that time in 2021. and. Now he gets to go up against his former assistant, Rhett Lashley, the offensive coordinator for the Mustangs in 2018 and 2019. Taylor, what's the approach for Lashley and these Mustangs? What's it have to be going up against Dykes here and these TCU Horn Frogs? Yeah, I think it's got to be exactly what it looked like for SMU against Oklahoma a couple weeks ago. If you think about what the Oklahoma Sooners have looked like in week one and week three against Tulsa, who we just saw, they've been dominant on the offensive side. The only week this year out of the three games that they played that they struggled was against SMU. And I had that game. We were there in Norman. And SMU did a great job of frustrating Dylan Gabriel. I loved Rhett Lashley's comment after the game where he said, look, we made OU earn everything. And they took away those shot plays. They played really strong man defense in some scenarios where I think it surprised Oklahoma. Where SMU said, look, we're just not going to let you beat us on deep balls. And we feel like we have good enough coverage on the outside that it's not going to happen. You're going to have to have the exact same thing against TCU. There is still a ton of talent from that national championship run last year that's still on this team for the Horn Frogs. The other piece that I think SMU is going to have to factor in this week is Chandler Morris running the football. Last week had over 50 yards on the ground against Houston, and that was an element that he's clearly very athletic, Does uses his legs sometimes more than others, but last week against Houston, he showed that a little bit more than he has in the past. That's going to be something that SMU has to take advantage of. But again, I go back to this game to me comes down to who has the better quarterback. And I think it really is Preston Stone over Chandler Morris. I think he may end up being the best quarterback in all of the conference right there next to Michael Pratt in the American. But it's going to come down to taking away those explosive plays on the defensive side of the ball, capitalizing when you get short fields and hitting those explosives like we saw SMU has done early in this season. 
2022, I mean, these teams completely different from what they were a season ago. This was an eight-point game last year. You allude to it, two different starting quarterbacks. TCU got out to a fast start. They were up by 21 at one point. But, you know, that then they had Max Duggan. I'm curious, you know, what are your thoughts here with Preston Stone improving through three weeks? Have we seen the best of him yet? I don't know that we've seen the best of him yet, but we've certainly seen what a difference maker he is. And SMU fans all offseason talk about how they felt like this was an upgrade from Tanner Mordecai. And if you look at what Tanner Mordecai is and, and how Wisconsin looks right now versus how this offense looks for SMU, I think there's a clear argument to be made that they have upgraded at the quarterback position with Preston Stone. Look, I have Preston Stone and this SMU team winning outright in this game over TCU. I think they will go into Fort Worth and get a win. I think they're the better team top down. And you will get – SMU will have everyone's attention after this week. That's what I think will happen. I still go back to that performance against Oklahoma and how impressive they were on the road in Norman. That game was 14-11 to 11 going into the fourth quarter. They had a chance to win that game if they don't fumble in the fourth quarter and then the game got – a little bit out of hand, but this SMU team is a really talented football team and they're also very confident. So again, I think they go into Fort Worth and get the win. Aside from quarterback play, you've obviously mentioned Stone, but this game for you, it all comes down to what? You have to keep Chandler Morris in the pocket, make him beat you throwing the ball downfield. Because again, I think SMU will be able to take away those explosives that, that, TCU relies on. If you can do that, if you can force him to beat you throwing the football down the field, take away the run game, over time, I think they will wear down this TCU offense. And then at some point, if you capitalize and create turnovers, that's where SMU has to convert those opportunities into points and really into touchdowns. In this game especially, you cannot try to trade field goals for touchdowns. You're gonna have to convert in the end zone. I think if SMU can do that, they'll win this game. Right now, SMU, they're 13th in the country in total defense. They're second in the conference, only behind Memphis. And speaking of the Memphis Tigers this weekend, they'll face Missouri, some other Tigers. Neutral site in St. Louis, getting the big win last week. There's Blake Watson smashing the stone after that monster win for them, picking up their first conference win. Taylor, this week it's just one of eight matchups between undefeated teams around the country. Mizzou fresh off their win over number 15 Kansas State. Memphis fresh off their conference win. For the Tigers, the Memphis Tigers that is, they were 0-4 last year when it came down to one score games. This year we're already seeing a different story. What impressed you with Memphis's late game grit against Navy? Well, Blake Watson running the ball, especially. I think you touched on that a second ago. And also, I know that this game is hard for you, Missouri <laughs> alum. Uh, so I know this will be a, a challenging one for you to uh, not show your bias too much. But for, for Memphis specifically, I liked how they overcame the adversity early in that game. They're down 14-7 to at the end of the first quarter to a Navy team that is certainly playing better. To me, Seth Hennigan also played better as the game went along. This matchup against Missouri, if I'm a Memphis fan, this is the week that you want to see Seth Hennigan finally take that full step forward and be the starting quarterback that Memphis has expected him to be. There's obviously been bright spots in his career, and he's done a lot of good things for them. But this is the type of win. If they can go to a neutral site and beat a Missouri team that is beatable, go back to Missouri's week two against Middle Tennessee. They did not look that great. That was a 23-19 to win. It's not like they dominated the Blue Raiders. There, would, there is an opportunity here for Memphis to go get this win, and I, I can't, can't overstate how important it is that it's a neutral site. They don't have to go to Missouri to play this game. So this is a winnable game for Memphis. Columbia is a really hard place to play. Let me tell you, we almost saw Georgia go down last year as the number one team there. So I do think, to your point, there is an advantage there for Memphis. Also, uh, maybe an advantage for Memphis. Brady Cook, the quarterback for Missouri, is day-to-day -day at this point. He suffered a knee injury in the second quarter in that Kansas State game. But he played through it in the whole second half. And they also have a redshirt freshman in Sam Horn, quarterback, backup quarterback, that they're really excited about. So what's the challenge for a Memphis defense to game plan against not knowing who's going to be starting at quarterback for the Missouri Tigers? Well, the good news for Memphis is Missouri, even through these three weeks and even over a, a Kansas State team, a ranked Kansas State team, they haven't been a dominant offense. They did put together a 30-point performance. But you go back to, again, their first two weeks of the season, 
it's not like this has been an offense that's been high flying and putting up 40 or 50 points a game. And that is the type of team that Memphis does not want to get into a shootout. They're not built for that. We talked about Blake Watson and running the football. This has to be a full team performance. And this will sound like coach speak, but it really has to be controlling time of possession, playing a little bit of keep away, away from Missouri, and then converting on any short fields and any turnovers. Just like we talked about with SMU against TCU. When you're the underdog, you have to do those things. And you don't want this to turn into a track meet against Missouri. Again, the good, uh, the fortunate part for Memphis is that's not Missouri's style of football. So again, I, I legitimately think Memphis has a chance to get this win on a neutral site. Okay, Taylor, so Memphis could win, but who you got in this one? Yeah, Memphis Tigers fans, don't get mad at me. I think they could win this game, but I'm taking Missouri to win this game. I think there's too much overall team speed. Memphis, uh, it's still not enough that I've seen from Seth Hennigan in big game moments like this to, to give them the nod. But again, it could happen. I'm still taking Missouri to win this game. Well, let me tell you, I'm picking uh, the Tigers to win this game. Politically correct, factually correct. <laughs> the Memphis Tigers, Missouri Tigers, right? I don't have to give you my answer. One Tiger will come out on top this weekend. And this will be a fun one for me watching one of my American teams take on my alma mater. Certainly looking forward to it. Uh, Taylor, transitioning now to another great matchup that we're looking forward to. Number 20, Miami against Temple. You know, for the Owls, looking back to last season, EJ Warner, three of the last four games, really put up some explosive offense. How does he get back to that type of quarterback that we saw him from him last season late? Yeah, it's been a little bit of a slow start for Temple, and it was last year as well. Now, they were trying to sort through who their quarterback was going to be. But to start this season, go back to week one against Akron, who I think Temple's the better team top down versus Akron. But they struggled in that game. It took them a long time to get going. They had to come back late in that game. They lost to a Rutgers team that I actually think is pretty solid and better in the Big Ten than most people expect. And then last week, Norfolk State, they took care of business like you would expect them to but it still looks a little bit clunky on offense. This, unfortunately, is probably not your get-right game because Miami is very clearly talented. You saw how they played against A&M. Now, they were home for that game. I understand that, but there is a lot of team speed for Miami. Mario Cristobal has done a nice job in year two overhauling team speed top-down. So, again, I don't think this is the week that Temple gets right on the offensive side. The following week, they've got a big conference game against Tulsa, and that to me is where if I'm a Temple Owls fan, I'm looking to that week specifically as, hey, can we finally create some momentum and get that rhythm that we saw for this offense in E.J. Warner at the end of last season like you touched on? It's also year two for Stan Drayton. Might not be the results they've been wanting to get, but he certainly knows how to coach his team and hype up his guys. Check this out. We get a chance to showcase our work. We get a chance to showcase this family. You understand that? Yes, sir. Okay? So enjoy this dub. And here it is right here. Former Eagles great Ron Jaworski Jaws on his social media says, watching EJ Warner play for Temple with proud parents Brenda and Kurt Warner. NFL legend supporting the cherry and white. Pretty cool to see North Broad Street getting some love. The Temple Owls and what Stan Drayton is doing there in Philadelphia. You know, for Miami, they're looking to avoid a repeat of a letdown before their bye week. Last year, losing to Middle Tennessee State a year ago, a week ahead of their bye. So maybe they learned from that. Maybe they didn't. Maybe the Owls will be able to take advantage of that and maybe pull off the upset. We'll see, Taylor. But another set of Owls, the Rice Owls, taken on South Florida. It'll be the debut for Rice in the American Conference and also the debut for Alex Golsh as the head coach at South Florida in his first American game. We saw South Florida last week have some success against Alabama, holding them to just three points through the first three quarters. What do the Bulls have to do to take away Rice's offensive strengths? Well, Rice's offensive strength to this point in the season has been the downfield passing game, which if you followed Rice football over the past few years, that has not been their MO. They have been a two tight end, bringing the fullback, ground and pound, wear you down over the course of the game type of offense. This year, you've got JT Daniels, a couple performances. You go back to week two against Houston, he throws for over 400 yards. Last week against Texas Southern was well on his way to that type of performance. He didn't play in the fourth quarter. They're hitting shot plays. Luke McCaffrey, obviously a big part of that. And for South Florida, they need to make Rice one-dimensional. Rice still 
struggling a little bit. They're averaging just over 100 yards on the ground. Some of that skewed because they played Texas in week one. But Rice still not running the ball as well as they'd like to between the tackles. If I'm South Florida, I'm trying to make this Rice team one-dimensional, heat up and bring pressure on JT Daniels and force them to beat you throwing the football under duress and under pressure. And then on the flip side for South Florida, they've got to figure out some rhythm on the offensive side of the ball as well. I know we just played Alabama and really hard to judge a team off of a performance like that. I know they just had three points, but again, it's Alabama's defense, the talent level there. It's just different. Uh, but I do think they've got to find some rhythm against rice. And this is a rice team defense. That's better than we've seen in years past. They're doing a good job getting pressure on the quarterback. So I think this is a, a really balanced matchup. This is really just going to come down to who plays clean football and again, for South Florida, they've got to get pressure on JT Daniels. Who's your pick? You made me pick up my in my alma mater game, so <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot here. Who you got? Uh, I've got Rice. I think they go in, and I do think uh, they play well enough on the offensive <laughs> side. If they can outpace South Florida, I think that's where you'll see Rice get a win. The only way that I see South Florida coming away with a win here is if they can create some turnovers on JT Daniels, which is, is certainly possible. But I think if, if Rice can get to that – 24 point mark. I'm not sure South Florida is capable of scoring enough on this Rice defense to keep up. So I'll, I'll take Rice. Rice South Florida, the lone conference game of the weekend, but this weekend American teams will be facing four teams in the AP top 25 poll, including UTSA having to go to Tennessee Taylor. Yeah, again, goes back to Frank Harris, which day to day right now with the turf toe, if he can't go, to me, this really is a, a week where you try to keep everybody healthy and then you want to try and build some sort of momentum, even in a loss, where you feel more confident going into conference play, which right now we, we heard Jeff Trailer's comments during the week. They are looking for some sort of spark. We touched on uh, the iron skillet. I, I think SMU gets a win there. And then the other one I have circled on this portion is Rice and South Florida, the only conference matchup this week in the American for the first time in the regular season, an American team will be facing the number one team in the country, UAB, having to go to Georgia to take on the defending national champs. Jacob Zeno ranks third nationally in completion percentage, though, for the Blazers. What are you looking forward to in that one? UAB to try and start fast. Obviously, Georgia, number one team in the country, maybe the most talented team in the country from a roster standpoint. But they struggled last week against South Carolina. Did not start fast. I think even in a loss, if UAB doesn't go in and shock the world, if they can start fast and create some momentum, similar to what I just said about UTSA, there are positives you can take even in a loss when you play a team that's this talented. And I think that certainly is the case here. And then the other one that I would call out is East Carolina against Gardner-Webb. They, they need a win. Sitting at 0-3 right now, this is an opportunity against an FCS team try and build some momentum, get to one and three, and have some sort of confidence before they get into conference play against Rice next week. You're also heading to New Orleans. To uh, You'll be on the call for Nichols at Tulane. Looking forward to hearing you on the call on ESPN Plus on Saturday night. Taylor, thanks as always for joining us, and we will see you next week. Sounds good. Thank you, Morgan. Mike Watson is a one-man machine. There goes Watson. Blake Watson doing great things with his feet. What a run by Watson. Big play, Memphis. Blake Watson showed all signs of being a complete running back for the Memphis Tigers. He had 237 total yards, including 68 yards receiving in the Tigers' win over Navy on Thursday night. Blake, great to have you here in the American Studios. Thanks for joining us. First off, I got to ask, had you ever used a sledgehammer before Thursday? <laughs> Thank you for having me. And, uh... No, that was my first time. Um, it was a great tradition that we have here, and um, I'm glad I was able to uh, be a part of it. What was that like, getting that win over Navy and you get the honors to break that rock? Take me back to that moment. Uh, it's a great honor. I mean, um, we went into that game uh, knowing we had that was our, gonna be our first uh, AAC um, opponent, and uh, we wanted to go out there and uh, get that win, and that's exactly what we did. And um, being able to be the one to uh, smash the rock at the end of the game. It was a great feeling and um, I uh, <laughs> want to do it again. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I mean, 169 yards rushing for you in that game. You know, writers, analysts, they've called it a breakout game for Blake Watson. I'm curious, how, do you, how did you define that game for yourself? 
I mean, um, I guess breakout for uh, this conference. I mean, I, <laughs> I've been doing this for a while now. I mean, this is my sixth year. So, um, yeah, I, I guess breakout for this conference, breakout for the school. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm capable of doing, and I'm going to keep on doing it. You mentioned sixth year of college football, first year, though, at Memphis. How does sort of the reality live up to the expectations that you had for yourself when you transferred from Old Dominion into the Memphis program? Yeah, um, I would just say that uh, that the whole reality of it is I, I knew that I could go somewhere and, and, and put myself in a great situation and Everything that's happening here right now in Memphis is exactly what I envisioned it to be. Everybody that's, uh, all the coaches here, all the players, everybody has been great to me. They all been um, just opening, uh, warming to me. And uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't um, ask for anything more from everybody. How were you able to really establish chemistry with the rest of your offense, quarterback Seth Hennigan, your O-line, obviously being such a big part of your game at running back? What were some of the things you did during the offseason to really create a good bond with these guys coming in and being the new guy? Well, yeah, I was, I was lucky because I came in in January. I didn't come in in the spring or anything like that. So I was able to hang out with them outside of football, get to know them as people, um, get to know their families, um, them get to know me, play video games, go out to eat, all types of things. And um, yeah, that, that's that's really how I mesh with them off the field. And when you mesh with somebody off the field, it just makes it e even that much easier to mesh with them on the field because you just know them on a personal level. And it just makes you want to go to war with them every sing single Saturday. And just getting to know them outside of football made everything that much better. Specifically in the running back room, Sutton Smith, the sophomore, has talked about just how great of a mentor you've been to the younger running backs. What are some of the things that, in lessons, you're really trying to impose on the younger backs inside that room? Yeah, I mean, all the backs, um, Jay, Ducker, uh, Katavia Hargrave, Sutton Smith, I just try to keep all of them focused, let them know that um, they're in great opportunity here at Memphis. Uh, to to be able to make their dreams come true and just stay focused, uh, stay humble, keep working, and um, they can do whatever they want to do as long as they uh, keep their mind to everything. How does the depth inside that room push you to be even better? Uh, it definitely pushes me. It, uh, it always keeps me on my toes. Always uh, lets me know that I need to keep on working. Um, and I can't. I can't slip. Your former running backs coach at ODU, Tony Lucas, had used some of the words fearlessness, toughness to describe you. Where do those characteristics come from in your personality based on some of the things that have happened with you uh, in your past, you moving around as a kid and then, you know, being able to transfer and come into a new program? Yeah, um, I would definitely have to credit my mom on that one. She <laughs> uh, She's just so strong and fearless. And um, just her growing up in college, Queens, I mean, she... She has a little uh, little edge to her. I mean, <laughs> she's so strong, and um, I, I definitely have to give that one to her. And um, just moving around as a kid, I was always the new kid, so I was always uh, having to learn new things, having to adapt, make new friends, and um, all of that. So definitely moving around, being a new kid all the time, just it, it gives you that little edge and fearlessness that um, really helps you in life. Credit going to mom. I love to hear it. I'm sure she will as well. What's one thing you've maybe learned about yourself since getting to Memphis? Um, definitely learned that uh, I could do whatever I want to do just in terms of just working hard, pushing through anything. Uh, I mean, camp here was crazy. Uh, some of the workouts here are just crazy. But um, definitely, definitely learned how tough I am and that I could do whatever I need to do. You showed that toughness, obviously, in the game against Navy. How will you take that here into this weekend, facing another group of 3-0 and Tigers in St. Louis at a neutral site? What's something that you're going to take here heading into this game that you learned about yourself from that game against Navy? Yeah, just keep preparing. Um, preparation is going to be key for us. Um, Going in with uh, preparation, confidence, uh, knowing that we can uh, do whatever we need to do. Uh, they're going to be a great team uh, across from us. They're 3-0, just came off of a big win. So uh, we know that we just need to go in there confident and um, be prepared.
Blake, thanks so much. Appreciate the time and best of luck throughout the rest of the season. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Each and every week, the conference announces the weekly award winners for men's and women's soccer and volleyball. And right now, we take a look at the top performers here in America's Best. The Offensive Player of the Week in men's soccer was awarded to Charlotte's Brigham Larson. The junior forward helped guide the 49ers to a conference opening win over UAB with his two goals and assist in the 3 0 win. SMU's Nia Rose, the freshman forward for the Mustangs, earned the Offensive Player of the Week in women's soccer after a record setting 6 3 victory. SMU tied the single game record for goals in a conference match, with Rose scoring two in a span of nine minutes to start 1 0 in the American standings. Finally, in volleyball, back-to-back -back Offensive Player of the Week honors for Kaylee Cassidy. The outside hitter averaged six points per set and nearly six kills per set to help the Golden Hurricane pick up a pair of wins over Ole Miss and Sam Houston. She finished with double-doubles in both matches and currently leads the nation in kills per set. Conference play is officially underway in American Volleyball. Earlier this afternoon, SMU in Memphis, the first match for conference play. Plenty more for you throughout the weekend. And in men's and women's soccer, we've got 14 total matches, many of those available to you on ESPN+. Each and every week, we count down the five best plays from around the conference. And this week, we bring you some rivalry games and some repeat award winners from top play performers already. First, though, we start at number five with Alabama at South Florida. Early in the first quarter, Bulls game plan, establish the run and be aggressive. How about Naquan Wright checking all the boxes, trucking right over an Alabama defender for the first down and some. The Bulls kept it close, but fell 17-3. At number four to the pitch for women's soccer. SMU leading Rice by four goals here in the first half. Leah Chansey drills it from the edge of the box from a tough angle and right off the far post for goal number six. And that right there ties the single game record for goals in a conference match. Impressive win for the Mustangs. Coming in at number three, Charlotte hosting Georgia State third quarter. The Panthers forced to punt from their own 13 yard line. Henry Rutledge back to receive the punt for Charlotte. Breaks an initial tackle. Blows by the defense, and he takes it all the way to the house. Rutledge added to the record books, a school record 46-yard punt return for a TD. But the 49ers fall 41-25. At number two, Rice up big on Texas Southern in the second quarter. Owls looking to add to their lead. JT Daniels running to his right, looking for a big play downfield. Nearly intercepted, bobbled into the hands of the top play machine, Luke McCaffrey. Watch this right here. Nearly intercepted, but McCaffrey able to come up big with it for the touchdown. And Rice completes the city sweep, taking down both Houston and Texas Southern in back-to-back -back weeks. Finally, at number one, the battle for the bell. A little revenge game for Tulane at Southern Miss. Kai Horton in at quarterback, gets it out to Jaquan Jackson, who blows by one defender and another right up the sideline for Jaquan Jackson, avoids the shoestring tackle. And number four comes up with TV number four of the season and the green wave roll 21-3. If you ever see a top play happen live, you can always let us know on social media at American underscore comp and use the hashtag American Top Plays. On Saturday, 11 American football games, 12 teams in action, 12 plus hours that you're gonna be able to enjoy from your couch. We'll recap all the action and look ahead to week five with five conference games on the slate on a brand new episode of All American next week. We'll see you then.